Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast. Cool products, the people who develop them, and how they do it. I'm your host, John Hirschtick. I've spent my entire life building CAD systems, but the best part of my job is I get to meet some of the coolest product developers on the planet. And in this podcast, you get to meet them too. My guest today is Mark Sanders. He is a principal at MAS Design, which is his company, and really one of the coolest bicycle uh, developers on the planet. He is uh, kind of the father of the triangular bike. He's made folding bikes of note, and he's the only person I know to have his designs exhibited at both the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Museum, also in New York City. In fact, he's the only person I know who's had his work exhibited in, e in either of these museums. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, John. That's a great introduction and lovely to see you. It's always a pleasure to see you, usually um, in the UK at one of the Develop 3D Live things and places like that. But real yeah. honor to be here. Great to chat. Well, it's great to, and this is the fun of doing the podcast for me, is it's just great to see you and talk with you. And yes, we, we met, if I recall, at the Develop 3D Live conference in the UK. And I remember talking with you and being struck by just what an interesting product developer you are, you know, just what an interesting designer and developer. Um, start right off, you know, the most, and you've designed a lot of things, but most notably, trying you say triangular bicycles i said as we were preparing in our discussions i said um folding bicycles but you said triangular bicycles tell us about the bicycles that you've designed yeah well um i suppose my most famous one is a triangular folding bike called a strider and basically it was my actually my college project when i went back to college and needed something which fulfilled both the requirements of in Imperial College, which is an engineering college, and the Royal College of Art, which is a design college. And at the time, I was commuting 22 miles from Windsor into London. And I tried the bus, which got into co congestion, the train, which wasn't door to door, cars went in congestion. And so I thought, hey, a design for myself, why not a bike? And uh, so this product developed uh, as a college project. And the, the core to it was, it's just three tubes and three joints. And you just fold the two, the three joints into a stick. So it's a stick with wheels when it's folded, or it's a triangular bike when you ride it. And it's been going for 30 odd years. It's, it's still in production and sells mainly in the Far East. It's been copied quite a lot, but um, the, the, the main, you know, original version is still for sale. Well, I suppose copying is a form of flattery. It's not good, you know, in terms of intellectual property. Um, but you were, you've told me that, that folding bikes were around a long time before you designed the Strider, right? Oh, yes. I mean, folding yeah. bikes go right back to World War I when um, parachutists uh, used to, you know, jump out of planes with a folding bike on their back because it's such an efficient way of you know you land you unfold your bike and then you ride out of the danger zone or wherever you're trying to get to and it, it, it's a perfect thing to combine two forms of transport and in that case it was an aeroplane plus land land use that's really amazing so so they i didn't know they went back to world war one and yeah. i what a what what a moment i i think of someone brave enough to jump out of a plane with a folding bike strapped to their back, you know, really <laughs> amazing human courage. But if the folding bike already existed for what might be 50 years or more before 50, 60, 70 years before the Strida, what were you trying to accomplish with the Strida? I suppose it, it, it was a fulfillment of my core philosophy, which is basically simplification. Because if you can simplify a product down to its absolute minimum of components, uh, it, it has benefits all the way through. You know, there's the bomb cost is lower. There's less tolerances to stack up. Um, it's lower cost to make, um, uh, easy to fix, less to go wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And 
that philosophy has kind of followed me through my career and um, I, I still really believe in it. I mean, Colin Chapman, another hero, the Lotus guy, uh, used to say, simplify and add lightness. And that applies to so many products, you know, and especially Wait, lightness. Simplify, what's that? You said simplify what after and that? add lightness. And add lightness, simplify yeah. and add lightness. Well, and that lightness, if I may say, is as you were alluding to, it's a lot of lightness. It's it's of course physical weight lightness, which was, but it's also just lightness of, of uh, concept work, assembly maintenance, right? Of of you know of many dimensions, even of the end user's perception. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, too many products today are are heavy to engage with. They. They, they, and I, you know, I'm really interviewing you about design, but I'll make my own comment. Too many products force me to have too complex a relationship with them for the value delivered, particularly software products. I think, you know, like yes. I, I just want to do something simple and I'm forced to create an account and log in and click and read and all this. And yeah, I'm reminded of a, of a, a book I love by an author you'd love to meet. Um, there's a book called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. It's about designing web pages. Um, boy, what I, I have to get Steve on the, on the podcast. But anyway, he has a chapter in there, Mark, you'll appreciate it. His chapter is called Eliminate Unnecessary Words. And the word unnecessary is crossed out. <laughs> <laughs> like eliminate. And I love that. And that's the, so you were, you were a believer in simp simplifying. So you looked at, did you know the existing folding bike designs? You know, did you, do you would use them? You had seen them and you were, were you frustrated with them or did it break down or what, what really you wanted to simplify, but was that born of a personal episode? Yeah, it was it, basically I tried them all and they're either very heavy, which, you know, when you're carrying it on the train, you don't want something heavy or complex or they had oily chains, which you don't want to get on your, your clothes, uh -huh. um, things like that. And so this thing is 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 clean. It's belt drive. So um, there's no oil or grease. And at the time, you know, we're going back 30 years. People said, you can't drive a bicycle with a belt. It will never work. But funny enough, now it's a common common thing, and the benefits yeah. have been realised. Belt drive bikes are, are really good because they're clean and they last forever. Compared with a chain which needs grease and picks up, you know, grit and then wears out and all this uh -huh. sort of thing. A belt just lasts. That's why Harley Davidson use them. Oh, really? Well, belts do wear out, right? Well, funny enough, on a bike, what happens is. It's not the belt that wears out, it's the pulleys. Because the belt, really? yeah, it's got rubber teeth. And so the rubber absorbs the little pieces of grit, but then the grit actually wears against the, the uh, plastic or aluminium pulleys. And so the first thing you need to change after, you know, 100,000 miles are the pulleys, not the belt. 100 a hundred thousand miles. Yeah. Well, you people, know, it's the same as it's the same as a car camshaft drive. Yeah. So, but people don't ride their bikes a hundred thousand miles. No, no. Okay, all and, right. And so you, we've yeah. never changed a belt due to it wearing out. Put it that way. So, um, you know, lots of people have great designs and even great projects when they're in school. And so, this was your 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 thesis or school you know a university project right college project um but but the story of strida is is notable because it wasn't just a school project but it became mass produced in volume and has gone through this interesting history tell us the story of getting it from a design at university into a product used by you know by what tens, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people over the last three, four decades? Yeah, well, it, I, at the time I'd gone back to college as a mature student, age 23, <laughs> uh, to sure. study uh, a combination of engineering and industrial design. And I needed a major project that covered both those areas. You know, it's a continuum between hardcore engineering and very soft sort of industrial design. And the, the course was aimed to 
cover that whole continuum. And that's what fascinates me. You know, the fact that design is 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 not just engineering and it's not just user friendliness it, and appeal. It's the whole lot, which is, is pretty complex. Anyway, this, a bike fitted both colleges' requirements. Um, it had to work, you know, be innovative engineering and also innovative design. And so it, it for me, it was a perfect project for commuting yeah. as well, from personal yeah. personal point of view. But how did it go from being a, a project to being a product that would right. make well, in volume? And, uh, you know, that's the, the that's because I know a lot of people design things, even in college projects. There are many good products, but they know very, very few great college projects turn into real products as you've done. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things I learned at the Royal College was that artists don't normally have an income stream. So they have to do a lot of PR to get themselves noticed. Now, for a, a guy with an engineering background, doing PR and self-promotion is, is kind of like a bit of anathema. You know, you don't do it. You don't talk. You don't big yourself up as an engineer. Right. So right. I learned that PR was kind of essential, not for me personally, but to get the product noticed to move it on to the next stage. And it was a perfect platform because um, the RCA always have a, a really good degree show. And so a lot of people from the press and TV come to the degree show. And I caught on to that and I put the, I, mm -hmm. I was ahead with the project. So I managed to put lots of PR messages out, come and see this new triangular bike. And it got in. It got into the Sunday Times and some, you know, Sunday magazines and places like that, which attracted potential manufacturers. And one of them was a, a really interesting chap who was a serial entrepreneur, um, who was actually an early manager of um, uh, Greg Norman, the golf guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and and, and he, he 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 he. he a really good negotiator and a, a seer entrepreneur. And he saw this product and he, he he saw the potential in it. And so he said, right, let's form a partnership. You do the design and engineering and I'll do the business side. And that's how the, the, the product started. And together we worked on it and um, got it into production. And um, it, was a, it was an uphill climb because at the time, as I say, people said, you can't ride a triangular bike. It's all wrong. And you can't have a belt drive either because you should have a chain because the bicycle world is very, very traditional. You know, the bike's been designed yes. hundreds of years ago. Yeah. So if you rock the boat and, and, and make anything different, you get a lot of flack. I mean, this remember, this was before mountain bikes came, which was a major kind of um, change in the bike world. And so, yeah. but I, I, I persevered and, and we... we we did well with it. It, it. it still ruffled a lot of um, cycling people's feathers because it was designed not for doing hundreds of miles on, but for connecting other forms of transport. You know, it fits in a car boot or a trunk. Um, you take it on the train, you wheel it down the, the corridor. You don't have to carry it. And so it, it actually found its own niche. And it's, 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 it's the ownership of the company has changed hands several times, but yeah. it's still going, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's still going today. So today yeah. people are buying, someone on earth is probably buying a Strida, many people today yeah. and riding it. Well, how many people might be riding it today? Well, I, I would say um, there's probably made about 100,000 in total. Yeah. They make about 10 or 20,000 a year. In Taiwan, yeah. Uh, it's it's a brand uh, owned by a huge, great Taiwanese OEM manufacturer who make for all the big brands. Uh -huh. And this is one of their own kind of their own brands. So just as because they can't show their other work because it belongs to other people like, you know, Cannondale and all those kind sure. of guys. Sure. I and see. so and so uh, they have this as their own brand. And, yeah. and, and so it gets a bit of a little bit of promotion in a Taiwanese OEM way. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's awesome. And, and just going back to something you said, I just want to underline because I think it's so true what you said about how people told you you were crazy. Triangular shape, belt drive. Who's going to who's going to go for that? And you, like a lot of great designers, you persevered with your vision. Entrepreneurs um, are like that sometimes. 
you have to proceed. You have to keep going, even when a lot of people will tell you no, you know, and, um, and I think most great products, you know, do that in one dimension or another. But I want to also ask you, design has evolved. How many through many iterations, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's now up to about Mark five. And uh, yeah. it's a tremendous input from the the people that own the, the IP now. You know, they, they, they're right at the heart of the Taiwanese bicycle business, which is kind of like the main innovation area um, on bicycles. Um, you know, bicycles are, are, are made in Taiwan and China, even if they might be designed in, in the West. Well, they're not all made in Taiwan and China. We have some great customers that are making them in other places and even, I believe, still in the United States in some areas. So anyway, but we could get into that, you know. <laughs> I, you know. Um, but um, uh, I wanted to also um, ask you, let's see, I wanted to mention, okay, a cool moment for me. For you, how did it feel when your work got chosen when the Strida was at the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Museum um, in the exhibit they had? Uh, what was that like for you to be chosen for that? Oh, that was awesome because it, it was the, the, the exhibition, um, if you remember, was all about usability and ergonomics. And that's the thing about the Strider, which was always its benefit. You know, its users loved it, even though traditional cyclists thought it was a bit weird. And w one of the pictures they used, which was the classic uh, Henry Dreyfus picture of an ergonomic man riding a bicycle. And when uh -huh. you superimpose that on top of the picture of a Strider, which they did as part of the exhibition, he fits perfectly. You know, the, the, what's what's tended to happen in the bicycle industry generally is it's sports bikes have become the kind of the dominant kind of shape where people lean forward like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas um, for everyday riding, a more upright ride is is better for your back and for seeing traffic and that kind of thing. But. The, the, the bicycle industry generally, it is changing, tends to focus on the sports riders rather than everyday yeah. riders. Hunched over, yeah. You know, I could talk to you all day about Strida, but you've worked on other products. Can you talk about a couple other things that you've designed that you're proud of? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a, basically two strings to my work. One is, is bikes, which I love designing because they're so visceral, you know, bikes, folding bikes, e-bikes, that kind of thing. And the other side is more things like kitchen gadgets and even um, hospital equipment, more human-focused things. And um, I suppose the, the, the most uh, useful ones are things like automatic can and jar openers, which um, uh, have been great fun. They've always been a really interesting challenge. You know, um, the challenge for an automatic jar opener is, not only can you make this thing that you automatically put on a jar and walk away and it opens it, even if you're, even if the jar is so tight that a, a, a strong man can't undo it. But not not only that, but it must cost uh, three dollars fifty manufacturing price. <laughs> now it's easy to design something to solve the mechanical problem, but it's much harder to make it for that cost. And also to to work reliably. So, and yeah. but I love that challenge. You know, the challenge of making something that looks good is is affordable and actually works and solves the engineering problems. Well, um, I, I looked online and I saw on Amazon your can opener still being sold. I believe, and yeah. I, I actually I'm sharing a screen. Um, we can bring up this is your design, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, it's it's um, that's the that's the can opener, and then yeah, there's the, the jar opener. opener called. Somebody came up with a brilliant name. We call it the Robo Twist. In other words, Robot Twist. <laughs> robot <laughs> but, Twist. Okay. Yes. And uh, and, uh, and again, that that was a tough product to design. And what what was fascinating about that? I wanted to change the image of both can openers and, and jar openers. Before, you know, the kind of bent bits of metal with lots of sharp corners and things like that. And my aim was, imagine if you could make a, 
a can opener which was so friendly you could rub it against the side of your face and it wouldn't scratch you. <laughs> and going back, you know, 10 years when there were all metal gadgets with sharp corners, that would be impossible. Yeah. But why couldn't a, a product you hold in your hand and you use to open cans be smooth and functional? And so that, that, that's how it started. And it, it was a great product. The, the, that is one that has sold millions. Yeah, the jar opener. So here, I'm bringing that up. That's also on Amazon. And, um, you know, I was just thinking, I got to order some of these for, um, I know some people who would, it was just at someone's house the other day, a younger person, and I brought over um, some something to eat, and I wanted to open a can, and they didn't have a can opener. <laughs> so I'm going to get them one, one of yours, I think. Um, but um, yeah, it must be great. So these products, very different than Astrida, yeah. right? But for you... You're, you, I hear the enthusiasm that you speak of, of them with. That's really cool. So you're excited about these too. And the challenge, you said $3, $4 manufacturing cost, huh? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because, you know, there's so many people in the supply chain, you, you know, the downline. Sure. So the distributors, the shippers, the, um, ret the distributors in the country, the retailers, everybody needs to make their, their share. So that, that's why... I always believe that if you can get a, a really low bomb cost, um, everything yeah. else after that is positive because um, you, you, you can afford to either sell it to be affordable so that lots of people can buy it and benefit from it, or you can add a margin to help with your, you know, the business margins mm -hmm. of the product. But Getting something, it's much, put it this way, it's much harder to design, for example, a Ford than a Ferrari. Uh -huh. Because, you know, yeah. it's so easy to just throw money at a product yeah. until it works. And and that's yeah. what fascinates me. It really fascinates yeah. me that, that, that you, you know, if you spend time working on simplification and making each part do 10 different things yeah. and all come out of one, one tool, um, yeah. It's, a, it's just a fascinating challenge, you know? Yeah. Well, I can relate to that with, with um, uh, and I don't want to talk too much about CAD software, which is something we do talk about. But when we designed Onshape, we tried, we, we wanted to have a, 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 we wanted to go for simplicity too. Yeah. We wanted to have a simpler user interface. A lot of times people confuse that with less power. They're like, well, you're missing tools. No, we're not. We just, we just put them in a more elegant set. We also turn down the complexity in the user interface. There's a lot less distracting colors and iconography and all that. We just said, let's put all that on a diet and, and make the aesthetic informed, I think, by, by um, things like the Google search page as opposed yeah. to the old heavy applications of CAD. You know, it's very easy breezy. Mobile apps informed us quite a bit. And so we went for a simpler look. And um, uh I can really relate to that and, and uh, in software as well as hardware. I wanted to also touch on your early career background. We, we didn't get there yet, if I may move on. Yeah, sure. That. I'll yeah. just pick up on one word you used oh, yeah. there. Yeah. You used my favorite word. Oh, really? Yeah, you did. The what word elegance. Ah. Elegance applies to everything from engineering to coding but it also applies to things like music, design, um, art. Mm -hmm. It covers the whole continuum of product. And so you can say to someone who is a pure designer, that's a really elegant design. You can also say to someone who's a you know, hardcore mechanical engineering, that's a really elegant piece of design or even an elegant piece of maths. It's a beautiful word. Love yeah. it. So yeah. I'm so yeah. pleased you brought that up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we strive for Software. it. You know, well, design is design, you know. And um, uh, uh, now let me go back to maybe where some of that elegance, passion came from. You, Your early career, you were at Rolls-Royce, right? Early on as an apprentice? Yeah, was yeah. It, at the time, it wasn't part of Rolls-Royce, but they made wow. huge, great diesel engines and turbines and pumps and i had a fantastic apprenticeship because part of the apprenticeship is you go around all the different departments and learn the different skills you know from welding through to machine maintenance through to turning and drawing office and all that kind of thing 
Um, and they were later, the company was later bought by Rolls Royce. But I'm so grateful to have had that grounding in in practical engineering. It, it really set me up. So that helped you. And and also you designed, was it candy vending machines for Mars? Yeah, that's right. I went to Mars. <laughs> went to Mars. The candy company. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, and, candy and bar. yeah. Th th that was just a reaction. I, I found, although diesel engines and pumps and turbines are fascinating from an engineering point of view, they don't have human scale. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they live in a machine room. Whereas I'm more interested in uh, design for humans more directly. And so moved to, went to Mars and designed vending machines. And uh, that, that introduced me to the world of design. And in particular, the um, the world of design consultants because mm. I went there as a mechanical designer mm -hmm. and, and and Mars used these consultant guys and I thought these were like gods they came in and came up with the concepts and then we followed the concepts and I thought hey I want to do that oh <laughs> so you, you're thing. like I want that job exactly <laughs> I want to I want to be the concept designer. You know, that's how that's how life works. But you know, a lot of people think that not everyone acts on it, you acted on it. But was there anything that we'd see in the Strider or one of your other design that came from that experience at the candy vending machine? You know, um, or I even I yeah. suppose the, the human interface of vending machines, you know, how we, we design vending machines from the inside out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, working out yep. the mechanism first and then think about the interface last, whereas we should have done it the other way around. We should have yeah. thought about the human interface and then make that drive the mechanics. But that's how, the, that's how the engineering work, world works. You know, you kind of design yeah. the mechanics and throw it over the fence to an industrial designer to kind of make it sure. work with humans. Sure. But it, it should be a, a, a continuum. It should be all done together. And yeah. I suppose yeah. th th that's what I, I learned from Mars. Um, well, also, you mentioned Dreyfus earlier. That was one of his, you know, Henry Dreyfus. In fact, uh, just a little interesting thing. One of my most recent podcast guests was a student of Dreyfus. Um, Byron Block was one of my podcast guests focused on safety, design for safety, design of cars for safety. Um, Byron... Uh, was a student of Dreyfus. He's also my uncle, by the way, and the guy who got wow. me into product design and mechanical engineering when I was um, heading to college. He's the one who got me interested in all this. But Byron um, has his own really fantastic career, and he was a student of Dreyfus. And so I'm just tying, you know, you mentioned yeah. Dreyfus. And, you know, just tying it back in. And so anyway, I think that's great. Um, and then any other project you can tell us about that you're working on now? What's the next great thing coming from you, Mark, to the well, world? Uh, if you I can don't... talk about it. If you can't, that's okay. Yeah, just, well, uh, I've really got into, I've designed a couple of electric bikes for big companies um, in, in Korea and, and, and in China. Um, uh, the, the last one actually was was a really interesting project for the the, the great big Xiaomi corporation who make mobile phones and things like that. But yeah. they decided instead of my project, they do the, the mega successful Xiaomi 365 electric scooter. So, um, <laughs> wow, it, it, it sometimes goes that way. But as part of learning all about uh, electric power, I, I, I've always been a car fanatic. Um, well, not really a fanatic, particularly Lotuses. And I always thought that, wouldn't it be nice to have a car that does all this stuff, but in silence and also uh, for free, powered by my solar panels on my roof? And so I, I during lockdown, actually, I uh, converted an old 50-year-old Lotus Elan to electric. It's so... Cool. And and, and the, the the thing is, what my mission was was I, I was keen on doing electric. It was the second car I'd converted, but I wanted to because everybody said at the time we're going back, you know, three or four years ago. Oh, electric cars, the okay, they're fast, but they're far too heavy. They'll never be fun, and all this kind of thing. And I thought, no, I think it, they can be fun if you make them light enough. And so a lot of the exercise was juggling the numbers to get the range the speed and also keep the weight under its standard weight. And it ended up being 20 kilos 
you know, sort of what's that, 40 pounds lighter than the original Elan. Amazing, so, amazing. And, and that's led me on to dream about not my current project, but my next project, which would be a, uh, a micro light powered by electric. A because, micro light. Electric yeah, power. because in the UK, we have this uh, fascinating rule, which if you can make an aeroplane, which weighs, and it's a bit of an ask, under 70 kilos, um, you don't have to have a license. Obviously, it makes sense to have training, but you don't actually have to have a license and you don't actually have to have the aircraft certified. And so... Oh, wait, wait, is that a good idea? Because sometimes well, things you can do doesn't mean you should do them. But yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I, I've got some, you know, flying experience. So okay, but I wouldn't recommend... I mean, everybody says yeah. you, you obviously must train for this. In fact, you've got okay. to train to get the insurance anyway. So yeah. it, 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 you'd be really stupid to fly without training. But the plan for that, the dream at the moment, starting to plan it out, is to make a, a sub-70 kilos... Um, Airplane, basically, and a then... sub seventy kilos airplane. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's crazy. That's wonderful, actually. I know it's and, crazy. <laughs> an electric? You're saying electric plane? Yeah, yeah. And and the the, the initial the initial one will be petrol powered to to test the aerodynamics and things. But then going over to electric will involve you know juggling the weight of the motor which is much less than a petrol motor but oh with the weight of the God. batteries which are much higher but it's all a matter of juggling range speed and power and weight well um it, it'll be amazing to think that uh, I, I would love to see that aircraft and amazing to think that you're still working on great products um that can really touch and change people's lives and change our, uh, in the case of this plane you're working on, our sense of even what's possible. And so you can learn more about Mark's company, um, MAS, at I, M -A -S -dash design at um, uh, dot com. And uh, I also want to invite you to listen to other episodes, our audience, to listen to other episodes of Masters of Engineering or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you like to find your podcasts, or on YouTube for the video feed. Um, also, we love hearing what you think of these podcast uh, episodes. So make sure you leave a review and tell me what you thought of Mark and his story. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can follow me on Twitter, um, at Jay Hirschtick. Uh, Mark, thanks again for joining us and for inspiring us with the Strida and all the other stories um, that you had here today. My pleasure, John, and a real honor. I'd, I'd actually love to interview you about your career <laughs> and some of the tools that you've given us. But uh, uh, maybe that's for another time. But well, thanks so much. You know, really someday. Good. Oh, thank you. That's I, it's coming from you. It's a real honor. Um, maybe someday, but the, the joy of m the tools I build, the CAD tools I build is really in seeing the products that you build with them. So that's, what's exciting, but thank you very much. Very kind of you to our audience. That's it for today. See you all next time on Masters of Engineering.